From the Alex Trebek stage at Sony Picture Studios, this is Inside Jeopardy. Ah, oh, yes, there he is. Hall of Famer, Johnny yes. Gilbert. Inaugural Hall of Fame class. Yes, picks up his axe, slays us into this open of Inside Jeopardy. Uh, here I am. This is our exclusive and official podcast destination for all things happening in the world of Jeopardy. I'm Michael Davies, joined today once again by producer Sarah Foss. And Buzzy Cohen. Oh, yes. hello. Oh, very good. Uh, so good. Very um, good. I want to brag about our little show for a minute. Last week, Rolling Stone ranked us number 50 among the 100 greatest television shows of all time. We didn't just make the list. We're halfway up the list. Number 50. That's good. We're in the top 50. I mean, that's of the good. 100. Yeah. Yeah, it was the only uh, game show apparently in the top 100. Unbelievable. Well, it was a really nice article. That might not be true, but I, <laughs> I heard it and I'm running with it. Well, the good thing I is Jeopardy it. is not a show that is committed to correctness in information I'm wise. sure we were the only <laughs> quiz show, which is what we like to regard yeah. ourselves as. We, we are, are no show. simple quiz game show. show. We're a quiz show. You're so absolutely right. definitely the only one of those on the list. Very good. Well, definitely an exciting, exciting thing for Jeopardy to be honored by Rolling Stone. But this has been the most exciting time for Jeopardy ever. I, I can't, I'm not quite sure where we are in <laughs> Inside Jeopardy time, IJT. Right. Yes. I know there's, you know, I struggle all the time with, with Jeopardy production time and Jeopardy airtime. IJT, I sort of somehow, like I struggle in Christopher Nolan movies, like dealing with <laughs> what's going on in the timeline and where it all is. And I feel with IJT, we are recording this on a certain day of the week. It's going to be released on another day of the week i have to constantly ask sarah where are we in inside jeopardy time at the point that this is released what can i talk about what can i not talk about i don't deal well with restraint I know. despite you the, do not. the reddit thread there's a whole reddit thread by the way buzzy not sure if you've seen it <laughs> evaluating um the Pretty job i'm doing Michael. as executive producer i haven't i haven't looked at it much. no no, no but just what i would daily print out I, I haven't looked at it but what I would say if is that did. is that the conclusion that seems to be drawn yeah. is that people seem to be okay with my passion and aggressiveness as long as there remain these very conservative, what they believe are conservative forces on the staff who are there to <laughs> rein me in, perhaps conservative yeah. forces like Sarah Foss and her <laughs> death slayers, yes. perhaps, or or uh, Rocky or Lisa or sort of other people on the staff who rein me in occasionally. It's, uh, to tension go and do is it. important. Yeah. That's how you grow. I like raining, though. I would like to go out there and be aggressive and have ideas. Yeah. I don't mind a little bit of a slap back and told to sort of get in place. And I have to refigure what I'm thinking about. Yes, I will say you are easily rained. Easily, easily <laughs> maimed? Did you rained. say? Rained. Oh, rained. rained. <laughs> easily rained. Ooh, do I like that? I don't know. Whatever okay. it is. Whatever what it is. What you do on your private time is <laughs> <laughs> completely... All yeah. right. I'm going to tune us in that right now in... Inside Jeopardy time, we are two weeks away from the debut of the second chance competition. Yeah. And we want to just give a little update that uh, the official roster, the competition format, all the contestant matchups are now up on our website. And our fans may notice that there is one change to the original group of 18 contestants that we announced here on Inside Jeopardy, and that is Isaac Applebaum. Due to circumstances out of our control and his, he was not able to compete. And so we did end up bringing our top alternate, Erica Wiener Amachi. So she will now be in second chance. We were so sad. Isaac was sad to have him not compete in second chance. I'm sure we're going to work out another time for Isaac oh, yes. to come back, Isaac will uh, be back on the show. We're going to be working on that. But you can head to the Jeopardy website, Jeopardy.com, to view the roster structure and the matchups for week one and two of our first ever non-reined in second chance <laughs> competition brought to you by Moderna. Today's episode also kicks off our road to the TOC. So from now until the tournament premiere on October 31st, hashtag Deathly Double, we are bringing you exclusive interviews with our 21 Tournament of Champion contestants. That's right. I love speaking with each of our players and I'm excited to give you that inside look into how they are preparing for the tournament just what competing in this historic event means to each of them. So later in today's episode, you're going to hear from Jessica Singh, Maureen O'Neill, Tyler Road, and Jonathan Fisher. Really looking forward to that. I love hearing from them before they dip that toe back onto the Alex Trebek stage. We'll get into that, but we have some games from last week with champions David Sibley and 
Chris Panulo. And the second episode of Celebrity Jeopardy in primetime aired last night, and we saw Eliza Schlesinger advance to the semifinals. I now need to make the sound effect in the Chris Nolan movie of Inside Jeopardy yes. time, where we go into that place yes. where we analyze that. Okay, Monday, Michael Menkus. Uh, he was a two-day champion, I believe, at this point of playing this game, uh, versus Sue Adams and uh, the aforementioned David Sibley. I have to shout out, I don't know if anyone else on the podcast, but certainly Jeopardy fans out there would be fellow birders like myself. So the name David Sibley, David Sibley is the creator of yeah. one of the two foremost bird watching guides. And I had to look up if this was our David Sibley. It is not, but he is Different from- Different David Sibley. He is from Walla Walla, Washington, a place so nice they named it twice. But he's making his own mark. Now yeah. he's going to be known as the David Sibley from Jeopardy That's because- right. This was not just any game for him. He came in against a strong champion of Michael Menkes. Very strong. And he has a runaway, which was, I think, pretty impressive. After Friday's game, I really thought Michael was going to go places because he was playing very strong. But as we have seen before, sometimes that break, the Friday to Monday break, you uh, lose yeah. a little bit of that momentum. Maybe you don't get a great night's sleep in between because you're so you know revved up from yeah. having been a champion. David came out swinging, and what a game. Michael yeah. actually said um, in his comments on Reddit that he knew from the rehearsal that David was going to be strong. He was really good on the buzzer. He was nervous to go up against him. It ended up proving to be true. They come up against a hard final. No one actually got it correct. In the clue, we talk about high society parties. I think it led people to think of more mm -hmm. fashion magazines in yeah. that direction, but actually... Forbes 400 was what we were going for. So didn't matter for David because he had a runaway. He goes on to game two for him on Tuesday. Against two competitors from my home state of New Jersey. How often is that that we get two New Jerseyans and a Charlotte Cook from pretty right my neck of the woods in Essex Fells. Both of them are really trying, but David is in control of that buzzer. Charlotte was so close at the end of the Jeopardy round, then she gets that correct daily double in double Jeopardy. You feel like it's really gonna get to be a game, but then David just gets that other daily double, pulls ahead and runs a category, and that's always that's always a help. <laughs> yeah, he ran the uh, he ran the non nigh science guys uh, yeah. category, which I, I really enjoyed. A lot of response, by the way, we should say to my, I would just say positing, the not ah. yet reined in idea that I floated out <laughs> on Inside Jeopardy um, doesn't need to be reined in yet because it's not been enacted in any way. Um, but a lot of responses uh, on social about uh, the idea to, to award a cash prize of some sort to people who run a category on Jeopardy that would not, very would clearly, not would not affect game would, play. Would not, would, would not <laughs> add to their game total, would not be there. It would be a separate thing. Ironically, <laughs> uh, poor David, I mean, not poor David, he had a full runaway there, so he didn't bet anything, but he said in his post-game chat after, he was like, airports and aviation, that's my I thing, man. That. Like, I wanted to go big not on birds. that. Not I, birds. Uh, yeah. I, <laughs> Other close, things so close. Yeah. Um, I also love, I have to say from my personal experience, I really respect someone who bets zero when they have a runaway game. That was my move. I've talked a lot about why I did it. I really spent a lot of time with Sir Buzzwald during the Tournament of Champions, during uh, Second Chance. And really two things I really learned. Thank you. Two things I really learned. One, the strategy of finding daily doubles based on the kind of category it's in. Yeah. Because that's a big thing you talked to me about and yeah. you really educated me Yeah. Uh, on that. And secondly, wagering strategy, which, just a little tease, in TLC, wagering <laughs> strategy is, oh my God, yeah. what a story. Yeah, and when we get into those games, we can we can maybe do a, an addenda yeah. on, on clue selection <laughs> yeah. strategy because that okay. that's a big thing. We head into Wednesday. David is now a two-day champion. And this is the first game, not a runaway for him. He has a little mm, more competition. He's play. Yeah, Sam Wang from Ithaca, New York. Emily Hackbath uh, from Ames, Iowa. You can see, based on his buzz-in percentage in Double Jeopardy, that Sam was really going hard there. Yeah. But I think the standout was Emily. I mean, she had a big early lead. I was thinking this was her game to win, but then David just roars back in double jeopardy. Yep. Not a runaway, as we said, but he comes back with a big lead. That's right. And Emily, I, I had to love her uh, nickname of uh, Grandma, and I don't know if you guys saw it, but <laughs> I put a challenge out there. Anybody out there listening, if, you run, if you're in Ames, Iowa, you run into Emily Hackbarth, ask her for a Werther's original. If she cannot provide you with a Werther's original... She doesn't get to keep that nickname, I think. But. Okay. I liked that. <laughs> I liked good. that. All right, heading into Thursday, David's back as a three-day champion. 
comes up against two good opponents in Moira and Sonali. Big day being a three-day champion. Yeah. Because I think what any Jeopardy observer now knows, having seen the expanded TOC field, is that even though four days does not guarantee one a TOC slot, now you feel like this could be my TOC game, the uh, game four. Well, and he brought out the big guns, or as Ken said, the clerical caller, because yeah. he wanted to win. He yeah. knew he had come a little close to not yeah. winning the day before, so he that brought out... That may have been at the request of a certain non reined in executive producer <laughs> at that point, but yes, he did. And I will say, I, I had to do a little research and see if there's a technical name for that, and I, what I did find out is the one that he wore is affectionately known as the dog collar, because uh -huh. it wraps all the way around, oh. as opposed to the tab which is the one that you just see in the front. <laughs> Clerical fashion. Well, it was not planned. <laughs> Everything is random, as you know, but religion was one of the categories oh, in yeah. the Jeopardy round. Of course, David goes right to it. And he more, actually more missed gets one. It. Yeah. I know. He misses the first clue. Probably not going to live that down back at his home church. But again, it didn't seem to uh, impact his overall gameplay as it was another big runaway. I do want to point out uh, one thing that happened in the game. This is something that happens from time to time. In From Dawn to Dusk for $1,200, Moira selects it. She says, what is denim? The clue reads, it's a coarse fabric used to make coats as well as bags. We were going for duffel. We initially marked her incorrect. But as the game is progressing, our team of researchers and writers is going to work in this moment and seeing if that additional response, not that our initial one was incorrect, but if we want to accept another additional response, we ended up deciding that we should. And she got $2,400 as a result, you know, making up for the 1200 we had taken away. Clearly, we made the right decision. And we get to Final Jeopardy, and it uh, falls into, once again, into your purview yes. here, Michael. You, I heard you have another podcast. Yeah. It's a small sucker it's good, podcast. It's good that you have a hobby. Yeah, it is a hobby. Busy. Although I do have a new hobby, by the way, in addition to that. I started pottery. <laughs> oh, I'm really? obsessed. Anyway, we'll talk more yes. about that in my third podcast. <laughs> okay, uh, well, we're going to go back to this yeah. clue. Uh, the category was innovations. <laughs> yeah. The clue, seen by a worldwide audience in 1970, black pentagons were added to these to help viewers follow them better on TV. No one got it correct. I think hockey pucks was the closest. Yeah. Mm. Michael knew the response. Oh, it's, a, it's a soccer ball. I was all over this at home. I believe the name of that ball is the Telstar yeah. because it was broadcast via the Telstar the satellite. satellite. Yeah. And David Sibley actually said to Ken, I listened to your executive <laughs> producer's podcast. I yeah. should have known the response. I know. That's very funny. We do very well amongst the Anglican cleric <laughs> community. Um but of course, I did then give Ken in his ear. Yes. I told him that that the color originally of soccer balls they were all like tan. They were all like leather colored. Yeah. yeah. That. Ken um, says out loud, "I wonder what they were." And all of a sudden, he goes, "This just in from Michael Davies. They yeah, were tan. They, they were tan." tan. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. May I take this opportunity to promote the new Men in Blazers book, Gods of Soccer, <laughs> ah, uh, yes. <laughs> which is available for pre-order wherever you pre-order books or check at your local bookstore. It comes out October 11th. It's a hundred profiles of the 100 gods of soccer. Male uh, and female. Male and female, domestic and international, American <laughs> and non-American. Uh, it's a really fabulous book written with my partners, Roger Bennett and Miranda Davis, who works for Semen and Blazers. It's a really lovely book. Christmas gift, potentially Hanukkah gift for anybody in your family around the, the holidays who's interested in soccer. You will really enjoy it. Thank you very much for indulging me. You're welcome. <laughs> and now we're moving on to Friday's show, which I think was a gift for any viewers who are watching. This was a great game. We had Pam Warren and Chris Panula, once again, New Jersey representing beautifully on the show. Yes, Chris is introduced as a former poker player and we knew early on that he was going to prove to have those poker player type skills because he had $8,400 he wagers 7,000 of it on a daily double practically going all in and then so he gets a big lead but Pam she's right in there and so I think she was kind of inspired by his daily double so she wagers 4,000 on her own daily double and really closes the gap in on Chris but then yeah. he goes on a late run just barely securing a runaway. I might say, Michael, I think Pam could be someone we would consider for second chance. She also got final correct, but again, just Chris had pulled away. Yeah. He was uncatchable. Yeah, amazingly competitive game. We love these. 22 correct answers for Chris Panulo, 16 for Pam Warren, 15 for David Sibley. That's a really wonderful game. I mean, in reality, any of them could have won it. Chris Panulo wagered $221 in final. We have come to learn that is his girlfriend's birthday. Oh, so that's sweet. I love an that. important number. That's why he went ahead and wagered that. 
And let's not forget that at four games and over $78,000, there's a pretty good chance that we could be seeing David Sibley in our next Tournament of Champions. I had a chance to catch up with him after this game. Let's take a listen. David Sibley, four-day Jeopardy champion. How does that sound to you? It's beyond my wildest imaginations and coming down here and competing. It's, it's incredible. What were your hopes when you set out on this Jeopardy journey? I just was hoping for the chance to play. It's, it's a bucket list sort of item. And in, if invited, you, you want to come. And then after, after winning the first game, everything from there was just like a bonus. Now, four-day champion, you know we're going to be holding our Tournament of Champions every year, every calendar year in November from here on out. So there's a good chance we could see you competing again on the stage. What does that bring up for you emotion-wise? Intimidation, uh, just because people that win for multiple days in Jeopardy are really, really good at what they do. And by then, all of them are going to have their buzzer timing down. All of them are going to be studying up. So it would simply be fun just to come back and play another game. And perhaps earn a little more for your daughter's college fund? That would be at most excellent, yes. What has been the best part of this experience for you? I think the seeing how wonderful the staff has been, seeing how uh, really good-natured all the other competitors are. Um, everyone, I think, is cheering for everyone else in the game. Uh, it did not feel cutthroat or anything like that. And it was just the sort of sense of camaraderie between the folks that make the show happen and those of us that were competing was just pretty incredible. What's your congregation going to think about this success? Oh, well, they're going to be looking for the tithe of my winnings, which they will get. Um, <laughs> but I think it's, it's going to be kind of a hoot to them. I had to sort of sneak away from town and just sort of say, I, I'm not going to be here this sun, Sunday. I'll tell you in a few weeks what's going on. So I think a lot of people are going to get a laugh out of it once they find out. Any chance the Jeopardy experience could weave its way into a sermon one Sunday? I, I'm guessing they will expect that at some point. So I got to figure out the way to make it work. Well, you have been a joy to have on the show, and we hope we'll get to see you again maybe in a possible future tournament. Thanks, Sarah. This has been a blast. Wow. Well, what a lovely man. Let's see if he makes it back to what is already shaping up to be another fantastic TOC next year's 2023 Jeopardy <laughs> postseason. Oh, I can't even wait. But now we have more to discuss. We had our second celebrity Jeopardy in primetime, kicked it off with three very funny contestants. Eddie Huang, Reggie Watts, and Eliza Schlesinger. I don't know how you all edited this together because I could tell just watching, I, watching <laughs> the finish show that it was pretty loose on that stage. They really were having fun. There was lots of humor and I just loved being in the audience. Yeah, well, you know, the Daily Beast uh, reviewed the first uh, episode of Celebrity Jeopardy, the amazing comeback win from Simu Liu over Andy Richter, and they called it the best drama on television. Legitimately, I think they yeah. said the best drama on television <laughs> is what they called Celebrity Jeopardy. And my feeling reading it is that's really nice, but that's not true of every episode. No. And this episode, one of the best <laughs> comedies on television, certainly yes. one of the best hour-long comedies uh, on television. But it was a really wonderful game. And it's something that the Jeopardy star, who sometimes there are various members of our staff can be quite serious about what they do. <laughs> These are the conservative voices of restraint. It was so nice to see them like almost crying with oh, laughter. Yes, we were show. laughing out loud. One of my favorite moments was in the what happens in Vegas category. And the clue was no surprise. The Paris Las Vegas Hotel has a 540 foot tall replica of this landmark. Eddie responds, what is the Statue of Liberty? Eliza follows it up with what is the Paris, even though we had Paris in the clue. And then Reggie was so confident, he responded in French about yeah. the Eiffel Tower. I like know. he's like, what I'll one up yeah. you with that. And that was just one of many great moments. We do have to talk about the category of one of our Jeopardy favorites, 12 time Jeopardy champion, my pal too, Austin Rogers. We went to his bar and he did a category for us called Austin Tens Bar. I think our players, you had know, zero idea who he was. They did initially. not know who he was in our world, and they weren't necessarily getting the responses. You know, right at the beginning, Reggie's like, Austin's weird, man. But then 
he got one later. He got gin and tonic, and he's, tonic, he's and he's like, me. Austin's kind of cool. He's growing yeah. on me. So I have to say that in our tournament of champions, Austin came in. No, none of us knew him. His shows hadn't aired yet when he competed yes. in the tournament of champions. And I was also like, who is this guy? What's going on? He is out of control. And now I count him as one of my good friends. I think everyone in the Jeopardy world will love the category. And I think by the end, Eddie, Reggie, and Eliza, they loved Austin too. Yeah. Yeah, and Eliza got a very tough final correct. Yes, yeah. she did. Jacqueline Hyde response. Impressive, and she's moving on to the semifinals. Eliza will be joining Simu Liu in that semifinal game October 16th. Be sure to tune in this Sunday to find out who their third competitor will be. Mm, dun, dun, dun. And I do, since we mentioned Simu Liu, I want to mention the tweet that he put out about everybody yes. trying to give him advice on how to play Jeopardy. And he said <laughs> what all of us who have been on a stage have said, you've got four cameras on you. It's freezing cold. There are two other people there who are really smart. You do that, and then you tell me. So I feel like all of the former Jeopardy contestants gave a little goobble gobble one of us uh, yeah. to They Simu did. Liu. They came okay, to his support. Good. That was great. <laughs> I love I it. I don't think he'll be wearing a short sleeve shirt to no. the semis because he did say Rookie it's mistake. much colder in the studio than I anticipated. Yeah. All right, we're moving on now. It's time to hear from our Tournament of Champions contestants. So first off, I want you to listen to my conversation with Jess Karan Singh, the winner of our first ever primetime Jeopardy National College Championship. Championship. Jess Karn Singh, welcome back to Jeopardy. Yeah, it's great to be here. So you've only competed in prime time. Yeah. What's it like to be back now in syndication? Uh, it's a different, I guess, uh, routine uh, in the prime time. It was also, we were all college kids, so they were much more lenient with like, hey, go here, do this. And now it's <laughs> like, you should know what to do. <laughs> I know your fellow JNCC competitors, you guys all formed a pretty cool community, a bond among you. So do you feel their support now that you're heading into the TOC? Yeah, yeah. I got some good luck messages and uh, yeah, looking forward to represent them well. No pressure. I mean, they are <laughs> looking for you to represent for the JNCC team. Now, this time, we're going to have an audience, something you really <laughs> haven't had. What's that going to be like for you? Were you able to bring any family out? Uh, no, family wasn't able to come, but uh, it'll be interesting because when I won the college championship, when they finally said, hey, you're the winner, and then <laughs> I heard like three claps, and I was like, ah. Yay, yay, <laughs> Jessica Harden. <Yeah. laughs> You've had a few months, I mean, basically since the beginning of the year, to start planning for this, knowing that you were coming back. You're busy with school, but have you had a chance to prepare or study? Yeah, I think just brushing up on stuff that I wasn't great at. I was worrying about it more uh, maybe two or three months ago. I was like, hey, I should study this, I should do this, do that. But at the end of the day, you know, just do it. Uh, you know, do the best you can. You know yeah. what you know. Yeah. And exactly. it got you this far. Yeah. Obviously. <laughs> you won a championship. Yeah. You got a trophy. Yeah, yeah. It was a good You time. got two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. <laughs> some friends for life. Well, we're happy to have you back. Good yeah, luck absolutely. in the tournament. Thank you so much. That was really interesting. It's interesting to think about normally the college competitors coming into TOC kind of have a leg up because they played a similar format here. Just Garen saying, oh, this is different than what I'm used to. So interested to see how he does in that TOC. Next up, we have Maureen O'Neill. You'll remember she defeated our four-time champion and TOC competitor, regular Virginia Margaret Shelton. Maureen O'Neill, welcome back to the Alex Trebek stage. How does it feel to be back? It feels fantastic. I cannot believe I am back here in the beautiful Alex Trebek studio. You have to have been having some months where you saw your name kind of dropping down on the list. <laughs> and if we were going with the old format, we weren't going to see you in the Tournament of Champions. Tell I, me about those months. Well, it was a shock to see it on, there on the first place. So as it, as it went down, I thought, well, you know, and people would send me screenshots that like, you're going down. I'm like, thanks for Thank the you. reminder. Thank you very much. I, wasn't, I don't check that, you know, like the weather every five yes. minutes. Yes. Uh, and then I thought, well, it was so nice to be <laughs> nominated. <laughs> Uh, and then someone did take a screenshot and made like a poster for me of it when I was still on it. And I, so I, I thought that was, I, I had the memory of it. You had the memory. And no, it was a thrill. When I got a text message saying I was back in the game, I thought, well, <laughs> well let's see what happens next. This should be fun. Well, fun. I would say that is one word I would use to describe. When you were playing the game, you were having so much fun. And that's, you know, so enjoyable for us to watch. How was that experience from your perspective? I couldn't believe I was there. And I couldn't believe how fun it was. And that I was. Do, I was doing well and I was surprising myself, but <laughs> but not really. And I thought, you know, just think about, uh, I know a lot. I know, I mean, I, I, I can do this. And then you sort of get it and you get into this rhythm of doing it and you think, oh my God, I think I'm nailing it. Yeah. And then it all, of course, falls apart, but it's exhausting. And I've told people, it's a lot of adrenaline coursing through you. And I, 
I just wanted to enjoy the moment and, and be in it. And just, I thought if I'm not having a good time here, when, when am I going to have, be having a good time? So. Yeah. Well, and you played against another fun champion, <laughs> Margaret <laughs> Shelton. So, you know, you came in against a 40 champion. So that had to be a little intimidating. I know. She's so lovely though. The iron lady. She was, and she's <laughs> tough and she's so, you know, one of those so smart and you'd think I'm going to get annihilated by this woman. Uh, but off stage, you know, we had met each other. So I thought, well, we'll see how this goes. You know, I'm going to be all right. And we had a great time playing against each other, I think. And and I was glad to I mean, I barely won. Let's be honest. Oh, but you I went mean... on to win three more. <laughs> so you know what? A win is a win. A uh, Jeopardy champion, a four day Jeopardy champion. <laughs> that that no one takes that lightly. Exactly. Well, we want to wish you the best of luck in the Tournament of Champions. Anything can happen. I know. Thanks so much. I'm so happy to be back. It's good to see you. Oh, yes, Maureen. Adore Maureen. Also a uh, a fan of a certain soccer podcast um, <laughs> and a really great player, lovely human being. And now my conversation with our five-game champion, Tyler Road, who we've mentioned before, had one of your favorite tweets of last season, Michael Davies. Take a listen. Tyler Road, welcome to the Tournament of Champions. Thank you, Sarah. It's How's exciting it to be, to be here. back. In some ways, it feels like we never left. This has been a whirlwind year, but you know, I think this this is the only time we've been here where they want to get photos of us walking up and down the stairs. So it feels a little different. <laughs> it does, and you know, who could have known that coming in as a five day champion would be like less than average in this crazy season of super champions? I was closely tracking the tournament uh, standings on Jeopardy.com, noticing myself get pushed further and further down. I was grateful to hear when with the expanded format that me as the 16 seed would still be invited. So yeah, it's been a wild year. What do you think about this new structure? No wild cards, first to win three. What What are your thoughts? I would say watching the GOAT tournament was such an amazing event that I enjoyed as a viewer. I think now coming in, someone who's an underdog in the tournament, you're you're looking for variance. I think one thing the GOAT format does is it sort of negates that variance, but also it's still any given Sunday. Like any 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 one of us could beat any one of us on any given day. And what do you think about being kind of nominated the social chairman of Jeopardy these days? Uh, I'm excited that uh, <laughs> folks enjoy my Twitter. I, I you know, I I really love Jeopardy, and it's great to just be able to talk about it and to have found a community that wants to talk about it too. Uh, and I think you know, with regular Virginia, uh, there's there's been so many moments that have sort of gone viral for good reasons. So it's I I try to like keep it fairly positive, and I hope that others can sort of take that lead too. I love that viral for good. Yes. I think that should be our slogan. Anything that can go viral for good. I love reading your Twitter, and I think it's just another example of just this incredible incredible Jeopardy community that we have. Absolutely. I mean, Jeopardy is made up of people who are just plucked from their regular walks of life. I mean, librarians and professors and, you know, marketers who just get to do this crazy thing that they've been watching since childhood and now find themselves in this community of, of people who know what this wild experience is like. Nothing can compare to season 38. Obviously, the season of the Super Champions. What is it like to be a part of this historic season that I think people are going to talk about for years. Yeah, it's it's I think my place in the season is interesting too because I'm in this interregnum between Matt and Jonathan and then Amy's dominance. So, I like to think I was just sort of some connective tissue to to keep <laughs> people uh engaged until, you know, Amy the the goat could come in and and really take command. Well, we're so happy to have you back. I can't wait to see what you do on the Alex Trebek stage here in the Tournament of Champions. Watch out for Tyler. Thank you, Sarah. Tyler showed up ready to play, interested to see how that pans out for him. And lastly, I caught up with Jonathan Fisher, our 11-game winner who defeated none other than 38-game super champion Matt Amodio, who he will be seeing maybe in a rematch in the Tournament of Champions. Jonathan Fisher, welcome back to Jeopardy. Thank you so much. It's been, you know, a couple things have happened yeah. since your games. Yeah. Let's talk about that game. I think it's one that will go down in history. Three players, neck and neck. You go up against a 38-day champion. Jessica Stevens nearly wins, but you pull it out. Yeah. I, I went into that day knowing that Matt was there and seeing him just dominate people for 38 times. And I was very happy that I was in the first game of the day because I thought, okay, I'll go home and I'll, I'll get beat and I'll go home and have lunch and have a great story forever. And, and then it wasn't that, which is awesome, but it was, it was definitely a surprise. 
Yeah, two of the most successful back-to-back runs ever. Yeah. 38 days. Oh, and then a mere 11 oh, days yeah, for that's you. It. <laughs> that's it, just 11. Super no, champion good. stats. Yeah. What's life been like for you with those stats? Walking around the world like, hey, not that you go around saying it, but like, hey, I'm 11-day champion. I, I, I might say it. And All nobody, right. People look at me like I'm crazy, but I mean, it. you know, it hasn't been super different just because, you know, Jeopardy, I think, is can be a little bit niche, but the people that I've, I've gotten recognized and be like, are you... You want Jeopardy? And I go, yeah, and do the whole thing. So it's, yeah, it's crazy. Kind of the best thing to be recognized for, right? Yeah, totally. Because it means you're smart and yeah. you've been on TV and all this great Successful. stuff. Successful. Like, I, I love any kind of Jeopardy recognition, I think is the perfect one. Yeah. What do you do after your run? You kind of see all these other streaks continue. How do you then gear up for this ultimate tournament of champions? You know, it was funny watching people like Amy and then Matea and then Ryan. I would be like so nervous until they got to 11. And then they kept going. I'm like, okay, they've already beat me. So it doesn't matter. But I'm like, oh, you're at eight. You better stop. Oh, there's nine. Don't do it. Oh, this is 11. And then, uh, all right, they're done. So then they go. And then I can kind of enjoy it a little more. Sure. I was talking to Courtney Shaw and Brian Chang, who, you know, they were seven game champions. Like in a normal year of Jeopardy, that's like tippity top for you, 11. Like that's not getting beaten. And then- We just had this crazy, yeah, crazy it, thing. It was wild. It was wild. But it was really fun to watch, too, like coming off of Mad and then just seeing all these people come through. But even the amount of four-day people coming through, too, was it's been a lot of fun. What do you think about this new format? Uh, I like it. I, I do miss the wild card a little bit because that's just a little bit extra chance sure, to maybe sure. go a little bit farther. But, you know, in the in the wake of having people like Mad and Matea and Amy with these enormous streaks, it would feel a little bit like throwing us in with the sharks in that first round. So I I appreciate that they're getting a little bit more removed. We're so excited to welcome you back to the tournament and good luck on that stage. Yeah, thank you so much, Sarah. Well, I have to say, Jonathan certainly acting not necessarily like an 11 game champion. He had kind of a happy go lucky, happy to be here vibe, but sometimes that's what uh, takes you through to the end. It'll be, it's anyone's game. Well, um, it's time to answer some viewer questions. Uh, First up, Andrew asks, I was watching the first episode of Primetime Celebrity Jeopardy and Andy Richter mentioned to Mayim that while he managed to win his quarterfinal game in the 2010 Celebrity Jeopardy tournament, he mentioned that he could not compete in the semifinals since he was on tour with Conan O'Brien after their version of The Tonight Show was canceled. This leads to my question. In the event a celebrity during a special tournament or a regular contestant wins a quarterfinal game and is unable to compete in their semifinal due to unforeseen circumstances, will they be able to compete in another tournament or will they be ineligible to compete further? Well, Andrew, the rules, actually, the official rules say that any contestant must be available for their next scheduled appearance or forfeit their spot. Now, there are certainly times when we've reached out to contestants for tournaments. We've had people in the military who've been deployed and not able mm-hmm. to to come back. Now, that wasn't a situation where it was a semifinalist. These were quarterfinalists. So, I mean, you can best talk to it, Michael. We we can't make a all across the board, but in- well, look, we just dealt with Isaac. You know, we're gonna he 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 couldn't compete, and we're we're figuring out a time for him. I think we'll we'll all of this is on a case by case basis. What are the reasons? Obviously, we've been living through this COVID era, which is which is changing a lot of everybody's. Um, you know, ability to sort of schedule and plan and and do all these kind of things. And as much as possible, we want to see our contestants and the people we've booked and the people who've succeeded. We want to see them play. Okay, so Joe, uh, he asked, seeing the Queen Elizabeth II category on last night's Celebrity Jeopardy got me thinking about the process the show goes through uh, to turn around clues relating to current events and popular culture. Is it done quickly for the next taping session or do you want to do them for future taping sessions this category was turned around i think quite well we were lucky because our turnaround was so quick we had less than two weeks to turn around this first celebrity jeopardy episode so in a time like that you are able to put more timely material in yeah of course our writers are always striving to do that and planning ahead as much as possible but we often are three months in our jeopardy production time versus jat so it's not always possible but we're always striving to do it whenever we can Okay, great questions from Andrew and Joe. Thank you to everyone who's been sending them in. Keep them coming in. Keep on uh, going to the Reddit thread on the job I'm doing as an executive <laughs> producer. But do understand I am I am constantly uh, reined in. Uh, we'll keep them in check. Questions to Inside Jeopardy podcast at gmail.com. Um, okay, that wraps up another episode of Inside Jeopardy. There was a lot in that one. Thank you. <laughs> 
so much, Buzzy, always being uh, here with us on the pod. Looking sharp again. That's another beautiful suit. It's got a little bit of a sheen to it today. Oh, Once again, a peak lapel just matched with just very beautifully chosen little almost a gingham check shirt it's maybe yep. uh, yeah. a tight yeah. gingham yeah tight, tight gingham. gingham with a striped tie you know it's one of those things that people never know where to wear a striped tie i would say with a check shirt striped tie got to be careful yep got to be careful Lot but if you get on. it right going it's, uh, on. it really works with that suit people say it's a power clash i say it's just power Okay, very good. (laughs) Join us next week as we discuss another week of gameplay, including our new champion, Chris Panulo. Love him and more Celebrity Jeopardy. And you will get to hear my conversations with four more Tournament of Champions contestants. So make sure you subscribe to the podcast, rate us, leave us a comment, share across social and follow us at Jeopardy on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook and on YouTube. We'll see you all next week. Grab your guitar, Johnny. like that video, click this button. What is the subscribe button?